Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO show. I'm your host, Kevin Appleby, and today I've got Miles Downey with me. Now, Miles is an experienced coach and an author of three books, all about coaching and getting the best out of people. So I thought it'd be great today if we could have a conversation about how to get the best out of your finance team. But first, Miles, welcome to the Grow CFO Show. Hello, thank you for inviting me along. Miles, our audience don't know you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background? A number of things. I started my professional life as an architect. And within about six months of my first job, realized that that wasn't for me and was incredibly lucky to pick up a book called The Inner Game of Tennis, which was first written in 74 by a guy called Tim Galway. And I was a good tennis player. And when I say good, you've got to make that relative. So I'm Irish. I was in Dublin. Tennis wasn't a, a massive pastime for many people, and there was no coaching, so good relative term. But I was keen and interested, and this book, The Inner Game of Tennis, revealed a world to me that was kind of at one level obvious, but had been kind of hidden and not talked about, which is like, what's you know, we talked about the outer game of tennis, how to hold a racket, where to put your feet and all of that stuff. But nobody spoke about much about what was going on inside and how how to manage the various conversations that one has with oneself. And that was absolutely transformative. It it showed me that not only was it that it was possible to work with what was going on in your head, but that also that there were other ways of helping people learn, other ways of helping people perform to their best. And that was the start of everything. I remember to this day telling my mother to her great disappointment that her son was going to give up being an architect and going to become a tennis coach, which she didn't quite understand. We got there in the end. So you be- became a tennis coach? Yeah, that was that was the way in which I learned my craft skills. Uh, so if you in, in the world of coaching, there's kind of two ways of thinking about it, one of which is it's about imparting your knowledge. There's another way of thinking about it, which is, in fact, more impactful, which is about how you activate the other person's capacity, innate capacity to learn. So I actually give people golf lessons occasionally, not for silver, just, you just well, sometimes as a demonstration. I know nothing about golf, but by using the skills I have to help that person learn, they improve. That kind of natural learning is an incredibly powerful capacity in others to rely on. And that's a whole big story there. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more how that works. I mean, I'm fascinated by that as a, as a kind of lapsed golfer who's not very good at all, talking to somebody else who, who's not really a golfer, but can coach in golf. How, how does that work? How do you make something that you aren't deeply skilled in work as a coach? Well, the first thing is the most difficult thing, is to overcome the years of conditioning that say that in order to help somebody learn, you have to teach. And then that's patently and demonstrably untrue, because I'm pretty certain that nobody taught me how to walk, and I'm pretty damn good at it right now. This is true. And I've had a lot of fun watching grandsons. Well, you watch you precisely. And it's almost easier with grandchildren because you don't have the temptation to intercede in the same way as one does with one's own offspring. So it's almost that detachment and that joy almost helps the whole process. So the, so the, 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 the notion is that awareness is curative. That's a bit of a mouthful. So becoming more acutely aware of what's going on allows that thing to change. So if I'm giving a golf lesson, I'll say to somebody, hit some balls, tell me what you notice. And at first, they don't understand the question. And for a while, they start telling me what they notice. And they say things like, my knees feel sore. Oh, okay, hold on. Wait, which knee? Both or which? And they say, oh, the left knee. Okay, what else do you notice? My hands on the club, it just feels a bit awkward. Okay, what, what else do you notice? There's something about the way my hips are moving. And I'll say, okay, tell me more about which of those is the most interesting. And they'll say, oh, the hips. So what are you noticing about your hips? And all the time as I'm asking this question, the thing that they don't know is happening, but I do, is they're becoming more and more focused. They're entering a state of a mental state that you might call flow. And when you're in flow, that natural capacity to learn kicks in. 
When you're in that mental state, when there's no doubt in your head, where you're not trying to do something the right way, that innate learning capacity connects. And learning is so quick and so fast and sticks, and it's utterly joyous. That is really interesting. because I've never thought of flow in that way before. And I've thought of flow as kind of the, the term for your doing something you're getting on with it and kind of you think you've been doing it for 10 minutes and you've it's actually two hours later or you've got the the athlete maybe saying oh they were in the zone yeah but i i've kind of thought of that as as getting on with something that you really enjoy yeah not really associated with learning at all yeah yeah it, it's i mean it is the it is the same mental state but you're just asking for a different output it's a remarkable place. It's just because of the way in which time passes, because of the quality of the performance that you give, the enjoyment that you get from it and other people get from it. It's a vastly misunderstood concept. Misunderstood for this reason is people think it's something you have to get into, right? And actually, it's there all the time. It just may be there in very diminished quantities. And if you just ask yourself, hold on, how much flow am I in right now on a scale of 1 to 10? You, probably, you might say 0.5. But ask yourself in 10 minutes time, and then another 10 minutes. And by the time you've asked yourself the question four or five times, the flow state will have increased. Awareness is curative. So it's always present. If there's no flow, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get so that. That's get joyous. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you can put yourself into the flow state, simply as that. Yeah. Simply by asking yourself, am I in flow? Even easier, so the, the guy I mentioned, Tim Galway, the author of the Inner Game book, became a good friend of mine ultimately. And we were, we were hitting some tennis balls, and I hadn't played for a while. I was recovering from an injury. And at one point, I, I just screwed up again. And I'm going back to the back of the court collecting a few balls. And I, my, the voice in my head said, God, I'm hating this. And I stopped myself. I just said, That's, that can't be true. There's got to be some level of enjoyment. You're with a man that you have great affection for. You're playing the game you love to play. You're not hurting anymore. There's, there's got to be some. So I, so I said, how much? So actually, how much am I enjoying this? And it was two on a scale of one to 10. And then I hit the ball into play. Tim and I played out the point. Three, five, seven. So within about six rallies, I was at seven and eight in a state of flow and playing the best tennis I was capable of on that day. So enjoyment and flow are actually very close bedfellows. Mm. Yeah, which is why, and when you start getting into thinking about this in the place of work, you know, where are people going to produce their best work <laughs> when they're enjoying themselves? Yeah, and that, yeah. funny enough, that you predicted exactly my next question, Miles. Well, that's because we're how, partially how does sports in flow. Coaching apply to business. So, one, you take the principles. You take the principles out of that. You take the fact that a good coaching conversation has a structure, a structure like something like. There's a quite a famous model that I and other people created in the past, which is called the GROW model, but essentially it's five questions. What do you want to talk about? What do you want to get out of this conversation? What's happening? What could you do about it? What else could you do about it? And what are you going to do? And it's a very simple structure that, that actually permeates many conversations almost instinctively. And so the essence of a conversation, like a coaching conversation, is to ask those questions and listen like crazy to make sure you understand. If you listen with the intention to understand, what happens to the other person is they end up being clear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and awareness is curative. When they get clear, they make better decisions than they would have done anyway. And it doesn't mean just to be really clear. It doesn't mean that you don't intervene or make suggestions, or, but essentially you're reliant on the intelligence, the imagination, the creativity, the problem-solving capacity of the other person. And your job is to ignite those capacities. And the thing about that is that they don't become dependent on you. You're actually making them more powerful by the nature of the interaction. Okay. And I guess by getting people to answer questions in that way, that's putting them into that state of flow that you were previously talking about. <laughs> yeah, it does exactly that. They're, everything, they're focused on, on this one thing. The rest of the world disappears and coaching conversations that take an hour seem to take 15 minutes and people leave smiling. Mm. Okay. So, Miles, you're a multiple author. Yeah. All of this sounds very simple. You yeah. just give me a five-point model. Yeah. How do you get three books out of that? 
Well, one of them is spun. The one called the enabling manager, which maybe is is the, the relevant one to talk about a bit later, is spun out of the kind of the book that's most well known, the coaching book. But it's just dressed not for a professional or aspiring coach. It's dressed for a manager or a leader in a business. So it's a lot of the content is the same. And then the, the other one was enabling genius. And mm-hmm. enabling genius goes is kind of an extension of the inner game material that I learned. And what actually happened was that I was working with a number of people at the same time who had incredibly challenging jobs to deliver. And one of them said what was true for all of them, which was, Miles, this job is so difficult. I need to be able to use all my skills, all my potential to be able to deliver this and not die in the process. Can you help me do that? And I said, yeah, but I need to think about it a bit. What that got me to was how do I, without becoming kind of a mad guru type, how do I help people explore their potential safely? So that led me to pull a group of 20 people together and we did some research over a period of about 18 months. And we looked at people who had demonstrated greatness in a numbers of different fields. And believe it or not, we condensed it down to a very small number of things that you have to know who you are and not just know who you are in life, but you have to know who you are in that context. So if two people who you might know, Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer, two of the best tennis players you'll ever see, both of whom are fundamentally different on the tennis court. My point there is that they have different identities. So they each know what what I would call what their unique individual genius is, and they play to that strength, and they couldn't be more different. Nadal, bullish, resilient, powerful. It's not that Federer isn't powerful, but it's, it's more about grace and speed and agility. Very different. So, so you need to know identity, your unique individual genius, will or motivation, and mindset are the three fundamentally key things. You're having a mindset for success. And what most people don't, the fourth piece that overlays all of those is about development, learning, which is to say that you weren't just born with a quotient of will and that a finite quotient, you know, this person has more will than that person. It isn't like that. You can actually develop and increase your will. Mindset, you weren't born with a, with a mindset that says you, your thoughts and, and habits and practices are going to remain this way all your life. No, you can develop a mindset for success over time. And so that the last bit, the learning, the development is critical to it and sits across identity, will, and mindset. So what, how, what it was, was getting a number of clever people together into a room and batting this stuff around until we simplified it. That is really interesting. I think I, I can apply that to CFO community. Totally. You've got a pretty tough job. Yeah. You've probably developed through leading a finance function, being in the internal face of finance. You become CFO, the yes. external face of finance all of a sudden. All of a sudden. Advising the CEO. Yeah. You're the face of finance in front of the investors, the customers, the yeah. suppliers. Now, you've moved into a completely different world. And yeah. we know that the biggest challenges that our new CFOs find is, A, time. Suddenly, yeah. under a load of pressure, yeah, and B, kind of stepping out of their comfort zone all the yeah. time because they yeah. do stuff that they didn't learn how to do in yeah. their exams. Yeah, and what the danger is that you step into that leadership position and you do what you've seen other people do. You know, the sins of the fathers visited upon the child, and you struggle because what you don't try and do is what what well, very few people I know would do instinctively, is to understand who they are as a leader. So unique individual genius. What's your unique, I'll use the word genius, as a leader? Because everybody will have one and everybody's, and that will be different for everybody. And if you can understand what that is, then what you're going to develop is something that's truly authentic, that's you expressing yourself in the world as a leader. That immediately is a source of confidence. Because you don't have, so uh, working with a young man recently who moved from a small company to a much bigger company, given a much bigger role in charge of a much more diverse team, particularly in terms of age, so older and younger than him. And we were doing some work to help him find how he was going to lead that. And we got into the conversation about his unique individual genius as a leader. And he had this notion of literally an image of a teacher that he'd had in the past who was very inspirational. And he realized that actually the part of what he needed to do was to be teacher to these people because they had to make a massive step up in their performance. 
And so once he had that as the core of what he was about in this role at this time in his life, then his strategies become clear as well. He's a teacher, he, right? So yeah. once you understand it, what emanates from it is real, authentic. And because it's you made it up, you're going to do it. Not, you know, if you're told to do something, you tend not to do it. <laughs> okay. Unpick that a little bit further. Your own individual genius. How do you work that out in the first place? Well, first, okay, not easy. But, well, yeah, it does take time. But let me just say what I mean by the word genius, the word genius, which is the meaning of that has changed through the, the centuries. I'm kind of deliberately and consciously giving it a, my own meaning. I've done that. Nobody else has to buy that. I've chosen that. Because what I'm trying to do is shock people. You see, I spoke at a conference and there was one of those people who probably run the local tennis or cricket club. So, you know, the blue blazer and the brass buttons. And when I finished my speech at the keynote speech at the conference, he came up to me and said, you can't say that everybody's a genius. I said, well, so he got a bit cross. And I said, so let me, let me just test something. I said, do you, do you believe that everybody has potential? He said, well, of course I do. I'm a coach. I said, okay. So what you're telling me is that your potential is capped somewhere short of genius. He had to just breathe deeply for a minute and then mm, I'll think about that to his credit. But so what I'm, when I'm using the word genius, it's because the word potential doesn't mean anything anymore. It just goes in one ear and out the other. When I say genius, it catches between the ears. It stops people short. because And then I define it and I say, hmm, when I say genius, what I mean is the embodiment of your potential, your potential made real. Now you've got something you can work with. If I just say potential, it's an abstract concept that just doesn't work. So how do you get there? I've got a bit of a process that helps me to do that, which is a coaching process. And one of the questions I ask people is, what are you great at? In that frame, in that context of leadership, what are you great at? Not everybody has an answer. What do people come to you for? That's often a remarkable. So if people are in flow and relaxed with me, you'll get great answers. What are you becoming? Sounds a bit of like a therapeutic question. For some people, it works. So I have a series of questions and a little visualization exercise as well that sidesteps the rational mind over a period of a few months of working with me and pushing that back and forth, experimenting with it a bit, seeing what works. People get to some sense of what that is. Fascinating. So we're talking about potential. And I know in a previous podcast, I went in in, in great length into the coaching technique of performance equals potential minus interference. And the whole idea that the manager's job was to just simply get rid of the interference. Yeah. I'm guessing that you would sit behind that. And not only sit behind it, you'll find it in every book I've written. Right. Um, it actually came out of Tim Galway and the inner game. That was its origin. So it's absolutely, it's a very wonderful shorthand. Because if somebody has a lot of interference going on, you can usually see it in their face. And that should tell you to do something different. <laughs> mm. And think about what, what keeps you out of a state of flow. It's probably worrying about half a dozen other things that are going on in the background. Worry, fear, doubt. Yeah. 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 So we said at the beginning, we were going to talk about so how do you get the best out of your finance team? Yeah. This seems like the right point to go and ask that, that question, Miles. Yeah. And because of the way you set it up, I'm going to answer it slightly differently. Because if we take the best out you know, from of your team, then that suggests, at least following the thread of this conversation, that, that you want them to spend more time in flow, because that's where they'll do their best work. So if you increase people's sense of flow, and I'm going to reverse into a model through this. So if it sounds a bit awkward, just stick with me. If people know why their work is important, how it fits in and makes a difference in the organization in which they work. So if they understand the context, the why, that's one part. Then they'll feel engaged and feel like they're making a contribution. Not, you're not, a, not a contribution to kind of world hunger or something, but the entity to which they've signed up for that period. If then you help them understand the what, where the what is their role, their objectives, the standards, those kinds of things. And then you help them understand how, how they're going to execute that role. So I've now got three circles, why, what, and how. And how, what they equate to, the why equates to leadership. So my, my job as a leader is to ensure that the person I'm working with has clarity about how their job fits into the overall picture and why it's important, and then work with them to understand then the what becomes management and the how is about coaching. 
And my argument is that those conversations happen all the time, but nobody drew the circles around them. Nobody defined them clearly. So most people lose power because they don't know which conversation they're having at any given moment or which conversation is the most important. So if I have all of those three conversations, if people know why, what, and how, there's not room for much fear and doubt in that. I've got clarity. If I didn't know why it was important, if I didn't know what was expected of me, and if I didn't know how to do it, there's a particular Irish word I could use to there would say, I'm <laughs> not in a good space. I can't perform. So I'm not in flow. To the degree to which those things are clear, I increase my flow capacity. So for a person looking to get to the rest of the team, you lead, you manage, and you coach. And sometimes they might be part of the same conversation, and sometimes they might be solely one. So you move around them a little bit, or you, or you focus on one at a time. And therefore, then your regular conversation. And the beauty about this model is once you're clear about it is, it doesn't matter whether you're working side by side with people or virtually. Conversations remain the same and focused around these things. So it's a beautiful way of thinking about the remote working conversations, particularly when they're more challenging, say. Yeah. I think even though we've probably been doing a lot of remote working for three years now, mm. there are people that struggle with it in certain circumstances. I think hugely. In order to coach in the way that I've described, where you're reliant on the other person, their intelligence, their what you know, their capacity to learn, whatever. You've got to have huge faith in them. Yeah. You've got to have huge faith in their abilities and in their goodwill. Our workplaces are so structured now that not all of them, but most of them, that that goodwill isn't there, that the, the relationships aren't there, that the management job is almost more about supervision and control. We haven't moved away. From, we've known for 100 years that command and control is limited, and yet it's still the default position. So when, when you create separation between the manager and the person who's doing the work, the manager suddenly feels lost because they don't have the control they had before because they can't see what they're doing. So that's part of the problem. So part of the, those three circles, lead, manage, coach, they sit on a foundation of a, a trust-based relationship. I'm, I've got an awful feeling that those kinds of relationships are less and less frequent. Yeah. And my personal experience, and Dan and I set up Grow CFO across yeah. what we've been talking about, and that was based on the sort of relationship you're talking about, because we both knew the what, the why, and we each knew our, our strengths and could get on with the how quite easily. Mm. Now, I've also been doing consulting work over that period of time in a consulting team. And generally, the people in the team knew what they were doing, knew why they were doing it, had the skills to get on with it. The place that I found it difficult, Miles, is when you've got the most junior member of the team and you're trying to develop them and you're trying to teach them new stuff. That, to me, is where the remote working model doesn't work very well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So obviously you can do it a certain amount of it and you can do that certain amount less well or better. But your point is, I, I think this is what is being learned right now, is that the learning that takes place through proximity and the, the mentoring and guidance that takes place from, with good colleagues isn't happening. Yeah, And that's, as you've pointed out, that's a massive problem. There's, and there's a parallel problem, which is that it's so much more difficult to create a cohesive culture when that isn't there. Although culture is a strange beast, we do know that if it's not sufficiently robust, strange things happen. So it, it's a very important part of the equation. And there is no culture if people aren't coming together, almost by definition. Mm, yeah, certainly that I follow very much a sort of model that you've been talking about of let, enabling people letting them get on with and interfering very little. But when you've got that that much more junior person in the team, you kind of, if you're in the office, you're near them, you can have the occasional check-in conversation that's at random, that's not the forced phone in up to say how they're doing. And you're watching and you get a sense of when something's not quite right and you need to step in. Yeah. That's the difficult bit for me. Yeah. 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 So it takes us to another part of leadership that we don't talk about much, which is how you, and you said it at the beginning, which is how you rise above the situation and kind of look around you and take stock of who's doing what and not, not so much what, but how they're doing. What's their state of mind? 
and what do you need to attend to? But that standing back is something that's very difficult to do in, in the workforce because all of us are so full on. But yeah. it's, it's a key part of... It's an interesting thing. I, I spent the last... I, I, 18 months ago, I moved out of a startup. I'm still a partner to the business, but my role was complete. And the startup was about the building a, a mobile learning platform, which has been, I'm pleased to say, incredibly successful. And the guy who ran it was, uh, this, was, he was a, this was his third or fourth entrepreneurial gig. He knew his stuff. And it's like when, obviously, we were more senior people working remotely. We had people in the States, in Paris, in London, all over the place. Um, but he would talk about the old-fashioned thing of management by walking about. He didn't talk about it in, in those quite terms. And, and his rule as an entrepreneur was that was to make sure that everybody knew what the current primary obje business objective was. So he even on the phone, he'd say, with, with people, new joiners to the team, particularly, or maybe weren't party to all the same forms. So you'd, you'd hear them checking in, saying, "Are you clear about the current primary business objective?" And yeah, well, what is it? Okay, how does what you're doing relate to that? It was all done very gracefully and gently, but it was like it was such a connecting force. And there's, a, there's actually quite a lot to be learned from how entre a really good entrepreneur works because now of that, the pressures. That, of, yeah, that, that actually, Miles, is fascinating because being of a certain age. And coming from a, a culture, I, I grew up in 10 years of working for ICI, mm. you know, number one in the FTSE 100 at the time, an organization in the chemical industry that had a fantastic culture, yeah. a real, real thing about developing great leaders. Yeah. And managing by walking about was something that was talked about all of the time yeah. back then. Yeah. And kind of, I haven't heard that phrase used in conversation for quite a number of years. No. Yeah. But I believe it's something that works. Absolutely. You know, with all of us working remotely, kind of, it's interesting to see that that spin on yeah. how yeah. managing by walking about actually works. Yeah. And I think that actually there were two big American companies in the last week that have made it really clear that it is not optional to work from home all the time, that you have to spend three days a week in the office. And that the, the more senior managers and leaders have to spend pretty much all their time in the office for this very reason. Mm -hmm. The last part of this conversation about how those, how you build a culture, how you pass on information and you know, kind of the, the implicit mentoring and coaching that goes on when people sit side by side. And this, you know, that by managing by walking about, you pick up the vibes. Mm -hmm. And so many senior people are, I was speaking to somebody the other day who said, you have a large UK company or a client, and the consultant was speaking to a senior player, and said, you simply don't understand the impact that you have when you walk into a room, and how people will keep quiet, not speak up, because you're senior, and because you have a perceived power. So if you're not walking around and speaking to people informally and casually, you're going to just further entrench that nonsense. Of course you are, yes. Yeah. So from that point of view, then, Miles, what do you think the right balance is between working remotely and going into the office? Because I see no point in going to the office if all you're going to do is sit in front of a screen for eight hours and then go home again. Yeah. You might as well have stayed at home to do that. Yeah, I agree, except for the opportunities that get created. I mean, we have to remember that before COVID, organizations like Google and some others were redesigning their office spaces so that the toilet blocks, places where you could get coffee, you had to travel to them and people had to congregate and bump into each other there because they knew that the sharing of information, the sharing of ideas, the mixing that that created was of value, so much yes. value that it was worth redesigning the shape of buildings. So somehow we've got to, I, I don't know the answer to this specifically, but you've got to get enough of that going on so that the creativity, the, the sense of belonging, the engagement, all of these things happen while people can work also then learn how to work more effectively in their own way and in, and in their own time. But so the, so the hybrid model is here to stay, but I think the, the pendulum swings back a little bit towards spending more time in the office. Yeah. Actually, my, my son works for a fairly major telecoms organization and he and his team spend a lot of time working from home but they do go into the office one day a week and in that particular day 
and of sitting at a workstation by yourself doing stuff is actually banned. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it forces the conversations yeah. to happen, yeah. the exchange yeah. of ideas to happen. Yeah. And the idea is great. We can have one day a week where we get everything like this sorted. Now yeah. we've all got an agenda of actions to get on with. Go away yeah. and do them. Yeah. And I, I really like that style. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to account for different kinds of people's different needs and we've got to account for different kinds of work that require different levels of of engagement with other people so there are so many variables that i think each each organization needs to come to its own answer Mm. so miles Mm. fascinating conversation we're going back to the finance leader and getting the best out of their team Mm. what's the one piece of advice that you would see as fitting to to giving to to most folk that would like to be better at doing that? I could go back and say my notions of lead, manage, and coach, and notice that they're all verbs, do these things. But actually, I, I think before you even get there, investing time in building relationships that have a foundation of trust in them yeah. is about the most important thing you can do. All the rest will, will come from that. People knowing that you have good intent makes a massive difference at so many different levels. Yeah. And now apart from making yourself available and spending a lot of time with your team, are there any special ways of developing that level of trust? Yeah. And I would think about, I would take time to think about each person in my team and how I might develop that trust. I'm nervous of things that are superficial and kind of whimsical. I'm much more interested in in not so interested in is the wrong word. I, I think it's much more effective to actually do something that's appropriate to that person. So you've got somebody who's underperforming, you have the conversation with them, honestly and directly, offline, and you finish with, so how do I help you? For somebody whom you, you have a shared interest, work-related interest, get into that. So it's about finding points of entry for each person, and they'll all be different, but and spending time and being intentional and honest and truthful in that time with people. The thing that goes the most way with anybody is to be truthful because then that's where trust comes from. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. As soon as, if you say something to anybody and it turns out that it wasn't quite on the mark, there was an element of fudging it or whatever. Or manipulation. Credibility very, very quickly. Yeah. And yeah. I'm always very conscious that it takes weeks and months and years to build up credibility. Mm. Yeah. But it takes five minutes to lose it. Yeah. If you remind me of an expression, which is that if you want to grow asparagus, dig a trench a year ago. Yeah. And it's like if you, if you, if you, if you <laughs> it's, 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 so it's the same with relationships. I don't think it takes a year, but with intention and directness and honesty and no game playing or manipulation, you can move quite fast. Mm. So, Miles, it's been a fascinating conversation. What do people do if they want to know more? And you've you've written three books. Yeah. Which one would, would you guide the average finance leader towards? The enabling manager. Right. Because it was intention to the intention to write something that was axiomatic, clear, practical, kind of intuitively correct, but the emphasis on on practical. So it, you can read that book and start doing things differently before you've gone past the 10th page. So yeah, that's very, very practical, very, very simple to enact. And we make sure there's a link to that in the show notes. And if Great. people if people want to contact you, how would they do that? My name is Miles Downey with, with two Y's in there. And my email address is miles at milesdowney.com. That's and the website easy. is milesdowney.com. So yes, it is dead easy. I love to hear from people. Brilliant. Miles, thank you so much for being this week's guest on The Growth CFO Show. It's been a real pleasure, Kevin. Thank you so much. Great conversation. You do it really, really well.